Good evening and welcome to today's BIC streams for a presentation by Professor Anna Dalapikola titled Of Gods and Heroes, South Indian Painted Textiles. This program is in collaboration with the International Music and Arts Society. Professor Dalapikola's lecture is based on the catalogue she wrote. Here it is. Um, on the collection of Kalamkari temple hangings at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And she comes to us from London this evening to tell us about this extraordinary tradition that really reached its highest expression in South India. Welcome to our program, Professor Dalabikula. First of all, I wish to thank you to, for inviting me to this lecture. And uh, I hope that I can illustrate in a few words what's written in many words in my book. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Uh, for a brief introduction, Professor Dalapikola was Professor of Indian Art at Heidelberg University and has taught at the University of Edinburgh, the School of Oriental and African Studies and De Montfort University, Leicester. We actually counted the other day and found she has written five books for the British Museum, including their catalogue on South Indian paintings and books on Hindu myths, uh, five volumes co-authored and two co-edited as part of the Vijayanagara Research Project with George Michel, John Fritz and others, and several other books, including one on Tanjavur paintings with Kuldeep Singh, who sadly recently passed away. At present, she works in India with Anila Verghis on a research project concerning the art of the Vijayanagara successor states. A detailed biography with more of her publications is available on our website and in the chat box. Professor Dalapikula will take questions from the audience after her talk. You can type your questions in the Q&A box as we go along. And with that, I will turn the floor over to you, Professor Dalapikula. Thank you very much again. Uh, today, we are going to have a look at a group of painted clo and dyed cloths from Southern India, which unlike those which were made for the export to Europe and Southeast Asia are in the form of hangings and canopies. These textiles were commissioned by Hindu temples, by matas, and by individuals which uh, needed them for religious use. Other similar hangings were, of course, commissioned for the local market and uh, were also used at the local courts. The technique of Kalamkari is very compl complex and involved. And the main characteristic of this technique is the hand drawing of the design with a bamboo pen, obviously called the kalam, and dyeing of the cloth rather than printing or other surface application of color. European merchants had various uh, definitions, various names for this technique. The Portuguese called it pintado, the British called it chintz. And today, the designation Kalamkari uh, is widely used, although this recently has also come to include purely printed textiles made in and around Majilipatnam. How and when the Kalamkari technique originated is not known. The oldest surviving examples date from the 15th and 16th century and were made for export to South Asia. May I have the slide, please? And you see an example, um, the one for the Indonesian market on the bottom. And what you see on top is very interesting because this is a very ancient example of Kalamkari, which was found in Sustat, which is today a suburb of Cairo, and which has been dated around the 15th or 16th, 14th and 15th century. As you see, the Kalamkaris were, uh, were exported from India 
to the west and to the east. And there was a great interest, especially in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, for these um, Indian painted, Indian um, painted cloth. Uh, the memoirs and reports of the travelers uh, speak quite often about uh, painted cloths and cloths and temple cloths, various kinds of cloths. However, they were first noticed the Kalankaris, such as we uh, know them, I mean, with the, the, the temple hangings, I should say, were noticed, were first noticed outside India on the occasion of the colonial exhibition of 1886 at South Kensington. On this occasion, the Ramayana from Kalahasti, may I have the next slide, please? was acquired and is now in the Victoria and Albert Museum. The reason why nobody knew of the existence of the temple cloths before 1886 is because the traders were probably in touch only with the middlemen, Indian merchants or factors, and had no opportunity of seeing a temple cloth. However, this is my impression. Even if they had come across one, I'm sure that they would have considered its bold design and vibrant colors very crude, especially when compared to the very fine um, kind of paint, delic delicate painting of, uh, of a delicate chintz painting, which was prepared for the European market. Now, unfortunately, we don't have much of, uh, we don't know much of this uh, temple cloth tradition before the 19th century, because the, the, the Kalankaris were executed on cotton cloth and as you well can imagine, with the Indian climate, the, uh, the, the, the cotton cloth decayed very easily because of the humidity, because of the, the, the weather, the heat, and the, especially the humidity. So the materials that we have now at our disposal for our studies dates practically from the, from the early 19th to the 20th century. Uh, they were used in various ways, either behind an image, in the case of the hanging, or above an image, if you come to think of the canopies, of which we have three. The most important function of such a temple cloth was didactic. As you can see here on the screen, each of the vignettes was identified by a, tele, tele, a caption in Telugu. And occasionally, individual characters were separately labeled, perhaps on a sleeve or on top of the head or something like that. They were used as I said, for didactic purpose, as the majority of these cloths illustrated either parts of the epics or the whole epic, as you can see here, or perhaps episodes from the Puranas, episodes from the Mahabharata, and probably also Stala Puranas, which are the stories of the local temples. As we speak of Stala Puranas, I must also add that we will see soon a group of textiles which illustrate major pilgrimage centers. And I'm speaking here of some, a set of Kalamkaris which were e executed in Southern Tamil Nadu, probably in the area of Madurai. Now, the composition of a Kalamkari is generally twofold. Either you have the story in registers which run around the central um, tableau, or 
you have the registers that go from one end to the plot to the next and then down and fill the whole, um, the whole um, area. Now, in the words of John Irving and Margaret Hall, who were the first to seriously speak about Kalankaris, they say, they described um, Kalankari as follows. In some cases, it would be not be inaccurate to describe them as murals on cloth. And can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, and here you see, for instance, a mural in the Sri Narumpunatha temple, Gopura, and at Tirupurai Marudur. And this Tirupurai Marudur is a small village of a few houses in Ambasamudram district near Tirunelveli. Imagine a five-storied Gopura filled with such murals. It's fantastic. You should go and see it. I'm a fan of the place, as you can well see. Anyhow. Um, generally, the narrative is, as I told you, arranged uh, in registers. And we are speaking now of the centers of production. We have seen Kalahasti, and there are, however, three or four very important sites which I would like to mention here. The um, workshops of Machli Patnam were already noted for their fine work, work in around uh, let's say 1650, about that time. Anyhow, uh, Francois Bernier, who traveled in India in the 1650s, writes in 1657 that uh, he has seen the Mughal imperial tent and inside it is lined with beautiful paint, hand painted chins which was manufactured for this purpose at Maslipatnam. Obviously, he mentions Maslipatnam. And I'm sorry that here something happened with my map that you can't see the, 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 the name of the places. Anyhow, the northernmost is Maslipatnam on the uh, Coromandel coast. Then the second is Chirala. Then you have San Tome, which is today's Chennai, and eventually you have um, Madurai, which is where Alagar Coil is written. And in the small inset, there are the workshops which were in and around Kumbakona. And these workshops were particularly um, famous at the time of the Tanjavur Marathas, because uh, apparently the Tanjavur Marathas had their clothes and all their materials um, stitched and painted there. And they were patronized by Shivaji Bonsley, the last of the Marath Tanjavur Maratha um, kings. The themes which we will see today and of course, we don't know how many other teams were available because we are working with a, probably a, a small fraction of the actual Kalankari production. So the teams that we'll see today are mainly stories from Ramayana, either the whole Ramayana or perhaps sections. And then something from the Puranas, from the Mahabharata, and of course, the depiction of holy places. We will start from coastal Andhra, and I would like to introduce the topic of the Ramayana with two remarkable canopies, which were executed there probably around the close of the 19th century. May I have the next slide, please? Yeah, this is it. And as you see, it's a very ambitious work and you have the whole Ramayana. 
And what is interesting here is that this cloth has the signature of the artist and the date in which it was completed. So the caption reads, in the year Vrusha, in the month of Chaitra, on a Thursday, in Chirala, Panchakalla Pedda Subbarayudu made this Sri Madhramayana Kalamkari. So the year of Risha corresponds April, May, 1881, April, May, 1882. And this artist, Panchakalla Pedda Subbarayudu, was a very versatile um, craftsman. And the museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum has two more works from his atelier. And another thing which I would like to note in this coastal and the Ramayanas is the selection of episodes. Of course, you can't concentrate the whole Ramayana in a cloth like this. So you have to make a selection. And I suspect that the selection was up to the patron or to the local usage. That I don't know, and there is no way to find out who called the shots, so to speak. I suspect it was the patron. However, in both the uh, Andhra canopies, which we will see, the preliminaries, and by preliminaries, I mean the stories which preceded the birth of the four Ikshvaku prince have the lion's share. Now, these are the story of Dasharatha killing the young ascetic Shravana Kumara, the story of the drought in the Ang Anga country, the arrival, the discovery of Risha Shringa in the hermitage, the courtesan that seduce him and eventually take him, bring him to the court of Anga. And eventually, Dasharatha arrives to the court of Anga and takes uh, Risha Shringa to Ayodhya, where the Putra Kamishti Yajna is celebrated. Now, if you look at this, a slide on the screen. The preliminaries go from the lower right uh, corner, the whole external external um, uh, row, and the Putra Kameshti Yajna is practically at the end of the second row. In the, I tell you immediately, it's in, in the top left corner of the second row. So you see, when you spend so much time in the preliminaries, then you have to cut down the others. So he has cut down on the Ayodhya and Aranya Kanda, there is nothing, and the Kishkinda Kandam too has been omitted. So the practical, you have a very, how would I say, personal, so to speak, selection of episodes, but that doesn't matter because anyhow, the person who was looking at this knew the Ramayana backwards, so no problems. In his or her mind, they were able to follow the stories, even if there were these huge gaps. Particularly interesting here, may I have the next slide? Yeah. Is a story which is local, a local story. We all know the story of Valmiki killing the, um, um, and the hunter killing the two crown birds. Here we have another story. Uh, as you see, a very dignified cop, uh, Brahmin couple meets this highway robber who is a lapse of Brahmin. And the highway robber, as you see there in the lower row, is on the verge of beating them because he wants his money. And then the gentleman says to him, before you kill us, 
tell us why you are behaving in such an unruly way. And he says he needs the money because he has a um, wife and a big family and he needs money to, for their upkeep. And the gentleman, the Brahmin says, well, before you kill us, ask your wife and your children if they want to share your sins. At which, as you see there in the corner, in the, right, in the left hand corner, the highway robber goes and talks to his wife. And his wife predictably answers, we want the money. The sins are your business. We don't want to share your business. At which the, uh, hunt, the, the highway robber goes back to the Brahmin wants to mend his ways, he begs forgiveness and wants to mend his ways. And the Brahmin tells him, well, if you want to mend your way, you have to meditate on Rama and of course, uh, speak out, repeat the name of Rama, Ram, 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 the whole time. And the poor man, who was not used of invoking the name of Ram, had a very difficult time. Eventually, he got into the habit. And may I have the next slide? And uh, of course, as usual, he was there meditating for a very long time so that the white ants built an anthill around him and he was buried in the anthill. And one nice day, Narada happens to pass by and he looks, peeps into a hole in the anthill and discovers the penitent highway robber. Can I have the next slide, please? And the end of the story is that Brahma comes flown on his hansa and inscribes the Bija Aksharam on the tongue of the uh, ex-highway robber. And since he was, he came out of an anthill, he was called Valmiki, being coming out of an, because uh, he emerged from a val, uh, uh, an anthill. Um, and incidentally, his descendants, and this is uh, an information which I found in that uh, encyclopedic book by Edgar Thurston and Rangacharya. Apparently, the descendants of this highway, ex uh, uh, highway robber are the Boyas, and they style, they styled, styled themselves apparently this was in Andhra at the beginning of the 20th century, as Valmikudu. We have then a second canopy with the Ramayana, which is totally different in style. You have seen the spacious style which, in which the former Ramayana was uh, executed, where the figures had ample, how would they, um, ample uh, space, so to so to speak, to breathe, whereas here it's absolutely crowded, full with figures. The narrative starts on the top left corner with uh, what seems to be a lotus lake, and then Vishnu Anantashayana, and then of course it goes all around the clocks various four times plus the central rosette and the scenes all around it. Uh, the selection of episodes here are um, not so drastically short, uh, short, not so short as in the other one. We have um, episodes from the Kishkinda Kanda, you have the Aranya Kanda, 
And of course, you have also something of the uh, Ayodhya Kanda. Not very much, but they're still there. What is particularly interesting here is the central tableau. May I have this next slide, please? Here. First of all, you will notice how crowded it is here, and it takes some time to decode the um, sequence of the elements around the central uh, central square because they go they are put rather not systematically not chronologically but rather haphazardly here and there and everywhere so let's start chronologically you see there in the um, right, uh, right bottom corner hanuman that meets sita in ravana's garden then, if you follow with the eye, you go down and you see that there is a battle between Hanuman and some Rakshasas of uh, Ravana's court. And eventually, Hanuman sets Lanka ablaze. And you see that extent of water on the left side. It's that shows how Hanuman then jumps back to the festland and meets Rama. The central tableau is very much a, stand, a standard tableau with Rama in seat and throne. On the one side, you have the, the Rama's brother, then Hanuman that uh, holds Rama's foot in his hands. And in the bottom, you have all the, the, uh, the allies with Vibhishana, which is the first person near Hanuman the one with a dark skin, that's Vishana, plus, of course, the seven Rishis, which are on the left of Rama. Now, if you, the next slide shows you the next, uh, uh, some details. First of all, the story of how Hanuman meets Sita in the Ashokavana. First, you see him in a, as a very small monkey in the tree, and then he appears before Sita in his actual uh, size. And then here you have the burning of Lanka and Hanuman that jumps over the seas, prepares to jump over the seas. No, really, he's extinguishing the fire, uh, the fire on his tail in the ocean. The next slide, please. Now, start again from the right. After setting Lank on fire, Hanuman goes back to Rama. Then you have to jump to the battle scenes on the left, on the bottom left side of the screen. And you follow and you see that at the end, there is Rama defeating Ravana. Then you jump across and you see Sita's fire ordeal. And the last scene is Rama and the allies returning to Ayodhya in the Pushpakabhimana. May I have the next slide, please? which shows you some of the details better. There you have Agni, uh, Sita Agni Pravesha, and you see that from the heaven, some Apsara or somebody like that is scattering flower petals on her. And, in, and she is there in front of Dama and Lakshmana, surrounded by these flames. And on the other, um, on the right side of the screen, you have this fantastic, I mean, lovely Pushpakavimana. It's really a flower chariot. Look at all the lotuses, which are the wheel of the chariot and all the petals and the fluttering, uh, fluttering banners and so on. I mean, really a triumphal chariot going back to Ayodhya. So, there are, of course, other ways in which you can um, show the story of the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, sorry. Next, please. And this is one of the Tamil um, painted plots from the area probably of Madurai. 
And here things are much more, how would I say, sober in such a way. It's no longer that riot of color that we have seen, but rather a more subdued palette. And even the story is really kept to the minimum. It starts with that, uh, uh, with Risha Shringa on the chariot, arriving in Ayodhya. The second vignette is already the Putra Kamishti Yajna. By the end of the first row, the four Ikshvaku princes are already born. Then in the second row, you see them being taught by Vasishta. And they are taught in many things among um, archery, riding elephant, riding horses, and so on and so forth. And eventually, Vishwamitra appears at Dasharatha's court, and we see the Rama and Lakshmana were already at the third, uh, third row, arriving in the forest, and they are there to protect the sacrifice of the rishis. I will go back to this later. Then you have Ahalya Vimochana at the end of the third uh, row, and at the last row is the arrival in Mithila, the breaking of the bow, and the, Kalang, the, the, the narrative stops abruptly with Sita uh, giving a pearl necklace to a friend while, Dasar, uh, while um, um, Janaka, Vishwamitra, Rama, and Lakshmana discuss a letter of invitation to be sent to Dasharatha to attend the wedding at Mithila. Now, the next slide shows you something very interesting. At the back of this cloth, there are some preliminary sketches, and I have the impression that at a certain point, the patron put his foot down and didn't like the selection of episodes which uh, were planned for that cloth. So the artist turned the cloth around and started again the story. And what is interesting here is to see the corrections which the artist um, made from the original drawing, you see, for instance, Vishwamitra's arm is not clear in the drawing. You have him with the shuk that goes through the canopy of arrow, which that would be um, impossible. And this has been corrected in the, in the good version of the cloth. You see that um, uh, Rama is building a canopy of arrows around the sacrificial fire in order to prevent the Rakshasa, Subahu, and Maricha to pollute the flame with all kinds of uh, uh, inauspicious things that they, were, that they had in their hands. So now, under the canopy, there is the flame, and Vishwamitra is there uh, performing the yajna, uh, protected by uh, from the um, from the onslaught of the rakshasas. The next, please, next slide, please. And this is one of the most extraordinary pieces in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum. I apologize for the dark slide, but that is something that it's not mine, it's one of the museum slides. So I'm here innocent of any wrongdoing, thank God. And what you see here is the full Ramayana not only the normal Rayana, uh, the, 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 from the Balakanda to the uh, Yudakanda, uh, but also the Uttarakanda has been illustrated here. It's very interesting because here the Balakanda is completely uh, omitted and the story begins with the intrigues at Ayodhya. The lion's share of the narrative 
is the life in the jungle, the stories with Shurpanaka and then the alliance with uh, uh, Sugriva and the arrival in Kishkinda and of course the battle scenes. This one is the battle scene, the battle scene Ramayana. A very interesting um, um, thing which I noted when I opened this cloth was that all the figures be, uh, bore a small number, you know, with a sticker from one to 400, I don't know which, which means that the previous owner had taken the trouble to uh, identify all the, the, all the figures and probably there was a key. Unfortunately, when this cloth was moved from the India Museum to the Victoria and Albert Museum, the key got lost. So here I was with my informant, a delightful uh, Tamil lady, trying to find out what the hell was going on. And I remember that she was very unhappy because she said that Sri Lankan Tamil is no Tamil at all. It's something that only Junglis can speak. So eventually we managed to uh, find out what, what was the subject matter of most of the episodes. And I would like to show you some of the details. May I have the next slide, please? In the first row, you have all the gods, and here you have Subramanian. Then, lower, in one of the later, of the bottom rows, is this scene which shows Hanuman before Ravana. And you see that he's seated on his coiled tail, and he's speaking with a certain, uh, how would I say, authority to Ravan, not only, he seems to be kicking his crown, which of course is something very daring. Now, the next slide shows Hanuman rather perplexed on the verge of crossing the ocean. What is interesting in this Ramayana, uh, cloth is that not only we have the Uttarakanda, but also the famous story, I mean famous in Tamil Nadu, in the, or I should say better, in the Tamil speaking uh, culture, uh, the story of Malyavan, also called Maili Ravana, Peacock Ravana, which involves the capture and the kidnap of Rama and Lakshmana, they're uh, being almost sacrificed to the goddess, the goddess Kali, were it not for the uh, arrival of Hanuman, who eventually uh, solves the whole situation and brings them back to the battlefield. And I must say that it's very important while you study this uh, clothes to bear in mind that there is also a local tradition. And sometimes you get stuck because you don't know the local story. However, I was fortunate enough to find out the story of Maili Ravana and I could finally uh, interpret some uh, that uh, particular episodes. And with this, we have finished the Ramayanas and we come to the Mahabharata. May I have the next slide, please? Uh, as you can imagine, reducing the Mahabharata to uh, an amenable um, dimension is a tall order. And I'm admired when I saw this, which, this, um, this uh, cloth, which is in the collection of the British Museum, I was absolutely amazed at the tour de force of whoever drew the plan because it covers 
practically the most, the salient episodes of the whole epic. It's a fantastic piece of work, perhaps not from the artistic point of view, but from the narrative. And here you see, you can appreciate some of the uh, Kalahasti um, borders. For instance, this chevron is typical of the Kalahasti atelier. Like in others, you might have seen this round the wheel motif, but the chevron is one of the most uh, significant patterns which you find in this atelier. Uh, along with the cat's footsteps, the pilli adugu, and the cartwheel. And here I want to show you only one uh, detail, the burning of the Kandva forest. May I have the next one here? And here you see Krishna and Arjuna, again, constructing a magnificent canopy of arrows to avoid Agni's uh, flames to be um, quelled by Indra's uh, rain. And here all the creatures you see are around Agni and some of the snakes are there. Only one snake manages to go out. And this is the snake that then, of course, has a rather important, plays a rather important role right, later in the story. Uh, probably this was in this was uh, executed in the first half of the 20th century and it comes from the church missionary society and it was it's a british museum uh, holding and it's uh, a unique piece in its way it's the first it's the only uh, mahabharata complete mahabharata cloth that i have ever seen can I see, may I have the next, please? Also in the British Museum is this Virata Parva episode from the Mahabharat. And the first eight rows are the story of the Pandavas spending their year in concealment at the end of their exile. And the last two rows are dedicated to the story of the cattle raid, the Goharana Parva. However, what I uh, am particularly interested in here, I, yes, I was telling you the cartwheel, uh, cartwheel um, pattern, typical of Kalahasti, Sri Kalahasti, you can see it here around on the border. Now, uh, I, I was talking about the central um, tableau. Please, can I have the, the next slide? Now, to my mind, the central tableau is a representation of the temple at Sri Rangam, with Sri Ranganatha lying on the serpent couch, the two Dwarapalas. And what made me think of Sri Rangam is the cavalry going around. You see this blue expanse with fish, giving us, us the idea or um, e expressing very very vividly the idea of the temple on an island. Of course, there would be much more to say about this, but here we are, uh, uh, it's beyond the scope of this lecture. May I have the next one, please? Then Krishna, the stories of Krishna, a beautiful Kalankari, probably of coastal Andhra, north coastal Andhra, because I have the feeling that there is much influence from Odishan painting. And what you see here is the usual, the usual um, scheme, a central uh, medallion and in the middle, uh, central, um, in the middle, surrounded by the various uh, registers. The narrative starts here with uh, uh, an image of Vatapatra Shai at the right hand bottom corner, and it goes on. And 
it, nar it narrates, it expands on the stories of Krishna's childhood, on his trunks. There are numerous trunks which do not find, uh, are not in the Bhagavata Purana or in any other text, but apparently they are very famous in uh, Telugu songs and folklore. So, for instance, there is the one in which um, Balakrishna arrives with a huge scorpion in the hand and scares, scares the life of, of a couple who's resting in bed, and so on and so forth. There are many of these little things. And apparently, uh, this lady who was working with me knew the pertaining songs. And she started singing for, for me the song of Krishna arriving with the scorpion. So as you see, very much of the Krishna of this Krishna Leela is indebted to the folklore. More classic, uh, classic um, episodes are these, like the killing of Agasura and Krishna defeating the whirlwind demon Trinavarta. May I have the next slide, please? And here we come to the serious things which happened to Krishna. Once that Kansa was um, killed, Krishna had to deal with, his, with Kansa's uh, father-in-law, Jara Sanda, uh, who was predictably um, defeated after a, a very intense battle. And once that Krishna and Balarama thought that they would be calm in Mathura, a barbarian, Kalayavana, arrived and was and threatened the city. And then Krishna uh, decided to defeat him by a ruse. He lured him in a cave where the King Muchukunda, who had once helped the gods uh, to fight the Asuras, was resting. And he was, and Muchukunda was sleeping there. And Krishna knew that the first glance of Muchukunda when he woke up would incinerate whoever was in front of him. So he lured Kalayavana in the cave and Muchukunda woke up, and of course, Kalayavana was incinerated. After this incident, Krishna and Balarama decided to move to Dwarka, and they remained there, as we all know. The next slide, please. We come now to holy places, and this is again uh, hanging from Tamil Nadu which depicts the Sri Ranganatha temple at Sri Rangam. And as far as the composition is organized, you see the top and the um, bottom row are devoted to the cavalry. As a matter of fact, the top row where you see all the fish and other aquatic uh, creatures bears the caption uh, cavalry Collidum Cavalry and the uh, lower one, Jest Cavalry. Again, the temple is very precisely drawn with all the smaller shrines, the most important, I should say, smaller shrines around the main one. And in the first row, top row, you see the temple Vahans. Then the second row is devoted to the various Utsava Bheras. And then you have the acharyas, and finally dance and music. What is rather intriguing, or particularly interesting in this cloth, is the depiction of natural life. Something pure natural life, something that we don't find much in Indian art. And I'm talking here of the lower border, where you see a grove near the, where the chariots are parked, the platforms which, uh, which um, are near the chariots and which are used when the priests um, put the, uh, the Utsava Murtis in the chariot, and there is a small Gopura. Now, I'm not sure what, which Gopura that is, but I suspect that this 
refers to one of the uh, inner prakaras because the big gopura of uh, the Sri Ranganatha Swami temple was completed in 1987. The next, please. And here we are in Tiruparankundram, another very famous pilgrimage place some five uh, miles southwest of, Ma of Madurai. And this is a much more complex composition because you have at the center the cave with all the deities which are in this cave, which is, I think, it's datable around the 8th century uh, of the common era. And on top you have the hill, on top of the hill you have the Darga of Sikandar. And all around, left and right, you have the main events of the life of Muruga. On the right, top right, there is the wedding of Murugan with Devayane, which happened at Tiruparankundram. And nearby, you see those two seated deities. Those are Sri Minakshi and Sundareshwara of Madurai. On the bottom uh, left corner, there is the shrine devoted to Ganesha and the temple tank. All around, you have various themes. First of all, you have the peacock, which is the uh, Sri Murugas Bahan, and the antelope. You know that uh, Valli was the, the second wife of Murugan, was, was uh, born of an antelope. So obviously, this is a reference to his second wife, Valli. Then you have the gurus or the acharyas there and the pilgrims that make their long way to the temple. May I have the next slide, please? That should be some detail. Yeah, this is the detail of the Darga on top, the Darga of Shikander. And um, the caption reads Pallivazal, which means mosque. And you have there a devout Muslim um, praying. And what is interesting are these characters down in the in the bottom slide, the pilgrims which go to the shrine of Murgan. Now, you can ask what happened of all this very lively uh, tradition of Kalankari. Unfortunately, in the intervening year from the end of the 19th century till the mid of the middle of the 20th century, the production dwindled, especially, I'm told, in the um, years between 1930s and 1940s, there was nothing much going on. May I have the next slide, please? Will it not? that in 1958, there was a, revise, a re revival of the craft by the All India Handicrafts Board. And what you see here in the slide is a, port is a photograph of the grand old man of the revival of the Kalankari tradition, Sri Jornalagadda Gurappacetti, incidentally, he received the Padma Shri for his work, at work, and he has his atelier now in Kalahasti. And as far as I can remember, he was he had lots of commission going. And one of the commissions, which is most intriguing, is the one which was, um, was um, uh, acquired by the Victoria and Albert Museum in the years um, 81-82 on the occasion of the uh, Festival of India in Britain. And Sri Gurapacetti uh, decided to enlarge his repertoire and uh, decided also to and to explore subjects completely outside of his own tradition. However, this work is a very interesting 
has many elements that are particularly interesting if you are if you are into uh, the influencing of the various uh, cultural streams. It starts with Ganesh and the artist asks Ganesha to protect him, to write this Kalamkari without errors, which it happened. And if you look at the borders, you will see that left and right, you have these beautiful Surasundaris from which hands uh, emanates a, a, a fabulous um, animated creeper. And on the top, at the middle, you have Kamadenu, which obviously has nothing to do with the West and with the Judeo-Christian um, culture. And down, you have elephants and other things. As you see, the composition of this cloth is exactly the same as the Ramayana we have seen at the beginning of this talk. Only the central uh, tableau is Christ in his majesty which the, with the Apostle and the Virgin Mary. And of course, you have elements of the Hindu culture such as Ganesha, the Surasundaris and the Kamade Kamadenus. And I believe that this facility or this willingness to adapt to new tastes, new, uh, um, new um, subjects, is the key to the survival of the Sri Kalahasti Kalamkari. The next slide, please, shows you some of the details, the Ganesha at the very beginning and one of the dramatic episodes in which Satan tempts Jesus. So, here I have almost, I have finished what I had to say. I may have the next slide, please. And I wish to thank you for your time and for your attention. Thank you, Professor Dalpikola, for this uh, wonderful introduction to these temple hangings. They're bold and vibrant and teeming with life and energy. Um, and they seem to tell not only mythological stories, but also document the life in the 19th century and tell us the history of Kalamkari textiles. Uh, we had a talk on Kalamkari last year yes. uh, on some of the examples for secular use, including those that travel to Southeast Asia and so on. And your lecture brings us to the distinct local aesthetic of these pieces for religious use. Um, and stories are, of course, at the heart of all of this, and I'm amazed by all the detective work you've done to track down these myriad texts and the local variants in Stala Puranas and Mahatmyams and to identify all the characters in these pieces, which is no small task. Um, we have questions from the audience, and I will combine some of them um, to begin with. Uh, the way that image and text illuminate each other here. Uh, they seem like precursors to cartoons or to moving images and film. Uh, there was originally a soundtrack, you say, they were visual accompaniment to recitation. Uh, and the framing devices and definition of space, you have registers, borders, dividers with pillars, arches, trees, shrubs, and animals, and um, even a water body in one case. Uh, and figure captions and labels for characters in Tamil and Telugu. Gemma de Alessandro uh, asks a question. Uh, she asks if there are any Sanskrit captions. Uh, and she also asks for the meaning of the word Kalankari. Well, the meaning of the word Kalankari, if I may start with the second question, means work with a pen. Kalam. Kalam, pen, kari, work. And as far as I'm aware, I haven't seen any Sanskrit, at least in the material that I studied, there were no Sanskrit inscriptions. It was Telugu and Tamil. 
Okay. Um, well, uh, one is also always struck by the circulation of these stories from the epics and Puranas far and wide throughout the subcontinent. Um, were these temple hangings like sculpture and other arts uh, one means by which stories traveled or were they really only a celebration of the local? Well, I think if I correctly understood, there is, let's say, you start with a core story, which is, so to speak, the classic one, and then you adapt it to your audience. So you have, for instance, it has no sense to uh, narrate something which happened in some place far away uh, in India and you suddenly arrive in Tamil Nadu and they have their own, uh, how would I say, their own traditions. And it's obvious that at a certain point, the two traditions, the classic and the local mingle. And the local tradition becomes stronger than the classic one. Furthermore, remember that there were the storytellers and uh, performers who uh, wandered through India. Like, for instance, the Chitrakatis that came from Maharashtra with the troops of the Marathas and percolated through South India. And their tradition, their stories are again full of uh, elements from their own Maharashtra, Maharashtrian origin, plus the st local stories. And then another thing, there is, for instance, the story of the Yadava caste, the Katamaraju Kata, which is fabulous. And it's very intricate. And I, I'm, I'm afraid that I didn't do in justice to those two uh, Ganga Saris, which are in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And that's, again, a local tradition. And the, only, the sole person who had studied it, I'm afraid either it's very ill or it's no longer with us. So what are we going to do? Okay, thank you. Um, there's also a, a very precious visual record here with the documentation of so many aspects of life, riders on horses and elephants, uh, hanging cradle, hairstyles and jewelry of women, the headdresses of men. I did notice a version of the pointy hat, the coulé of Anatolian origin that uh, Krishna Devaraya and the famous statue in Tirupati is wearing. Yeah. And, uh, you see it in the Lepakshi murals as well. And it's also worn by men in the Kalamkaris here. And Seema Bhalla had a question about the headdress. Uh, so if you could speak to the headdress a bit. Well, the kulai was generally worn, as far as I'm aware, by noblemen. And the first example of a kulai, I believe it's dated one, 1445, and you find it in the portrait of the Vijayanagara king Mandikarjuna in Hampi. That's the first example. He's there with his uh, uh, attendant Shirangu and he's wearing the kulai. Where it comes from is, of course, anybody's guess. My feeling is, as you say, it comes from the, what was called the Middle East. And if you look later in the 16th century, have a look at what Krishna Devaraya is wearing. He's wearing a jacket. Now, where have you seen someone wearing a jacket before then? That's again an Islamic influence of the jacket with the ribbons tied on the side and the kulai. There were this, you see, the Vijayanagara Empire was um, bordering with 
the territories of the Deccan Sultans. And as you well know, there were always discrepancies between both of them, but life went on. They were always, how would I say, in touch because they had uh, uh, trade agreements, they had people going up and down. So there was an exchange of culture. You find Islamic elements in the secular architecture at Vijayanagara. So there was a community, a, a sort of, uh, it was not, how would I say, separated, but there was a continual cultural di dialogue despite the political and economic differences. And we have to keep that in mind. No state was a state by on its own, especially Vijayanagara, that needed to negotiate, imagine, for, to get the, the, the horses. They had to negotiate with the Portuguese, and that was a no mean feat, because their, their, their horses came up from Goa, up to the Ghat, and arrived at Vijayanagara. And they had to, they had to keep the... The consultants quiet, the Portuguese quiet, probably their own generals, Nayakas, quiet. I mean, it was <laughs> quite an affair. And all these people had their own interests, their own culture, and it percolated, you see. And, and you see it even here with the headdress, so, uh, you know, a couple of centuries later three centuries later. Yes. So I was quite taken also with the depictions of the natural world, you know, dogs, fish, birds, deer, flowers, and uh, the Kaviri, which of course is the river of life for us in the South, that fabulous border with aquatic life, fish, turtles, water snakes, everything, crab, shell, yes. Yes. and uh, Sharda Srinivasan has a question. She says, fascinating talk, Professor Dalla thank you. I wanted to ask, since you mentioned the natural light, about the depiction of the ram near Agni in the Mahabharata clock from Kalahasti, which was so clearly depicted in a very naturalistic way, an animal not seen much in India. And where do you think the inspiration for that and such naturalism may have come? Since normally the ram, for example, with Agni is sideways facing. Yeah, in this case, it's, well, you must also think that this, um, that work, that special Kalankari was made in the 20th century. So it's probable that the artist took some liberties of being more modern, you know, more up to date. And if you look at it, all the figures have quite, uh, how would I say, uh, exotic kind of look about them. I have the impression, I don't know if it was a commission from the um, Church Missionary Society. I have the impression that it was, you know, tweaked here and there to make it more palatable, so to speak, to Western eyes. As a matter of fact, apart of being full of admiration for the selection of episodes, from the aesthetic point of view, I'm not at all happy with that cloth. Because I find it, it's a hybrid, you know, neither here nor there. Well, um, you, you had several um, sort of architectural site plans of temples and holy places uh, mapping in a sense. And uh, would these be like picture postcards of these sites that you could then send to send or take with you somewhere uh, to your own puja room or your place of worship as a reminder of a pilgrimage, perhaps? You mentioned calendar prints. So these, these would have traveled as well. Well, I don't know if Kalankaris were supposed to travel. I'm not sure. However, uh, my feeling is that these, vision, these vistas of pilgrimage place, which incidentally, if you have been 
to the actual place are remarkably accurate. I was stunned how accurate the Kalankari version of the place is. You can find your way immediately once that you have your Kalankari in mind, you know, left, right, left, right, and you find it. And I have the impression, or I suppose, that this kind of material was made for matas rather than for private use. And the same thing occurs to me, if I can, can if I may make a parallel, with the Tanjavur paintings of vistas of temples, exactly the same principle. Only that in Tanjavur painting it's much more elaborate, and you have all the gold, the the, the you know the. the um, glass decorations, the mirror decorations, and so on and so forth. But the, that's the same idea. Um, thank you. The religious syncretism with that amazing story of Alexander and Murugan uh, being friends, you know, who knows, perhaps there was contact between the regions. And uh, in the life of Christ, along with the road to Calvary, with Jesus carrying the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection, uh, the artist started out with a Ganesha in the corner. There have been uh, several questions about uh, uh, the life of Christ Kalamkari. Urmila Devi asks, uh, interesting that Christ should feature in the last, in that Kalamkari. Was this a one-off or fairly common to include all? And she also asks, um, she was interested to see the Kalamkari with Christ being tempted. Um, David Good asks uh, that he saw in this Kalamkari, there were figures in blue surrounding the Christ figure. And did those figures represent Hindu origins or did they just represent the diversity of worshippers? So is it a one-off and or are there others? And uh, this question- um because as far as I know, first of all, you would have you would have noticed that Christ is always represented en face. So the idea of darshan is there. And that's something which struck me. Secondly, there is at least one other Kalamkari like that, very similar, if not identical, in the United States. And I remember that uh, I was approached by the son or son-in-law of the owner of this uh, Kalankari, who had been a missionary somewhere in Andhra Pradesh and had something similar, you know, made for him. So, it's not a one-off. And as I told you in a private conversation, the day that I met uh, Gura Pasetti in his um, atelier, and that was in February 1998, he was working on an image of the tree of life and all around it, there were scenes of the life of Christ. Again, you have a syncretism, think tree of life and the life of Christ. It was at the very initial stage, he was just drawing it with the Kalam. I haven't seen it finished, but obviously there is interest for these new themes. But I don't know, the, the, the question was much more complex. I don't know if I answered what well, uh, the, and David Good's question about the blue figure surrounding the Christ figure, uh, are, are those of Hindu origin or do they represent just the diversity of worshippers? Which one? The figures? The blue figures around the... Ah, no, 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 no. That's just, it's just, uh, you know, to make it more colorful. It has nothing to say because... Uh, and this is one thing which I find a bit uh, bewildering, being um, a stickler for purity, too many colors in this life of Christ. I mean, to my, 
I feel like that, of course, it's a personal, I have to get used to it. But when you come from starting a range of traditional Kalankaris, the first thing that you say, oh my God, all this color. And of course, have you seen how many, how crowded are the compositions? And another thing which is interesting in the life of Christ is the vistas of towns in the distance, uh, churches, which of course weren't there, but it doesn't matter, it's fine, and other buildings. And that, of course, again, is something which comes from the West. Because as you have seen in the other Kalamkaris, yes, if you want a building, you just make a pavilion and that's it. You don't waste your time with the bell tower. And, and another thing, have you noticed how many clouds are there? There is a, a sort of uh, desire to put it in a landscape setting, which before was not there. Um, in terms of dating these, you really have only a hundred year period between the colonial exhibition of 1886 at South Kensington, uh, where you had the Ramayana from Kalahasti, and the Festival of India and Britain in 1881. Yeah. Uh, so, in fact, the earliest dated and signed piece which you showed us was from the late 19th century. And uh, Padma Priya S. Selva Kumar had asked for the name again of um, the artist. It's Panchakala Pedda Subbarayan. Yes. Yeah. Right? Um, and he was, I don't know, there is another Subbarayudu, must be of the same family. Right but not as good. I see. Um, and where, which part of the, uh, one person asks, where uh, is the signature in that? Ah, it's, if you remember the slide of the um, Chirala Ramayana, beneath the wedding scenes. Okay. It's there. And it was by sheer luck that was my first foray into this Kalamkari. And this charming lady I was working with, she said, oh, look, it's signed. <laughs> because she could read Telugu. I, I don't read Telugu. I manage more or less Tamil, but not Telugu. And I said, oh, God, you know, beginner's luck. <laughs> yeah, beginner's luck. Um, so um, uh, is, is it? it you said there were no samples before pre, before the eight, uh, 18th century. Is it just the problems of religious usage? Do you have damage from the suit of oil lamps, for instance? Uh, you know, with the tankas in the Buddhist tradition, you have some of that. Um, are are these, these pieces fragile because they've been used in certain ways? Well, I suppose that there must have been some clothes before, but, uh, oh yeah, I saw some fragments, where was it? But really fragments, little pieces here and uh, from Machili Patnam. And yes, now I remember, they have been, it's the story of Krishna and they have been published in a French book called Ferry and Yen or something like that as the earliest and that's probably close of the 17th century beginning of the or beginning of or 18th century I don't know but those are really little pieces like this at the most um, so I I, I had the, there's a couple of questions about uh, the artists uh, were there women artists and uh, who were they? Were these artists literate if, they, if there was writing there? Um, uh, and well, it's an interesting question. And the question which, I mean, you know, I wonder if they were literate 
I'm not sure. In some cases, you see that the uh, uh, writing is very clear. So it might have been someone else that wrote it. In some others, it's disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful, because you can't almost can't read it. And I believe that with during the procedure which you have to go through to um, obtain a kalankari, if the color bleeds, your writing goes and you have, I mean, you have to guess what was written. I'm not sure who wrote. My hunch is that maybe they had a scribe. Okay. And so it would have been in an atelier situation. I mean, you mentioned some workshops and centers of production. Uh, Machli Patnam is mentioned by Francois Bernier, you said, as early as 1657, uh, because of the chintz of the imperial tent. And then, uh, of course, Jean de Ferneau in 1666 says that the chintz from St. Thomas, today's Chennai, is better than the others. Um, so could you give us some idea of the, uh, the uh, Today, what are the conditions of production, perhaps, uh, and centers of production? How, well, know? the only big center of production that I'm aware of is Sri Kalahasti. Otherwise, I don't know if probably Karupur, but on a local scale, whereas Kalahasti is internationally renowned. Karupur near Kumbakona, maybe. But uh, uh, Machili Patnam, yes, especially for those uh, like your blouse and your sari, <laughs> these things. And of course, uh, also, you know, prayer, prayer cloths. They have quite a strong tradition in prayer cloths and all these things. I mean, those that, I mean, for uh, is the, um, Muslim prayers, you know, that you just put on the floor and then, yeah, instead of the carpet, yeah. That I've seen. I myself haven't been to Machili Patnam, so I can't say if there is much, but I know from Emporia and other shops that there are lots of things which come from the atelier in Machili Patnam. So um, I have several questions about, uh, uh, you know, other media. So patterns, as we know, travel across media, and these images happen to be on cloth, but their re relationship to uh, murals, woodwork, and metal sculptures seems quite evident. In fact, you cited Irwin and Hall calling them murals on cloth. Uh, I couldn't help noticing that the border on one of the pieces uh, with the boomerang pattern, I think you were calling them um, the chevron pattern. Yeah, is the chevron. Yeah, it's often seen in wooden lay marquetry work in Mysore. Um, anyway, Seema Bhalla had a series of questions about um, ajanta. Was uh, there's a very strong similarity uh, to the registered compositions in the row of hamsas? Uh, that's reminiscent of pre-classic era of Ajanta paintings. Is there a connection? And um, uh, she also asks, you know, the, she says the crowding uh, is reminiscent of Ajanta and the linear registrations in certain pieces. Um, uh, there were also others who asked, in fact, about uh, Pratna Shekhar, uh, who said there seemed to be a similarity between the Andhra Kalamkaris and the Lepakshi temple panels. Uh, so, your views on murals, ajanta, lepakshi? Well, if you look at murals, most of them are laid out in registers. Because it's a question of space. If you want to fit a narrative on a wall, it's no use, you know, making it big. You want the whole scenes, the whole narrative sequence, and you put it in your wall. So obviously you have to find a way to fit it in the wall somehow. The question of crowding, it's a very debated one. Uh, some 
uh, works of art are very crowded. See, for instance, the life of Christ and some of the Le Parchi murals, as for instance, the long panel illustrating the Girigia Kalyan is full, I mean, crowded, because you have to fit in not only the married couple, the parents, the Dikpanas, and all the other de devatas which are coming to witness the wedding. It's a question, I believe crowding is not only a question of style, but also what you have to fit in your wall. I'm having a bit of a problem with, uh, um, you know, thinking that everything derives from Ajanta. I don't believe that. Because I believe rather in a way, in a, how would I say, sort of general way, how do you manage to fit in a narrative in a space? So. Um, so a, a sort of related question, what is the resonance of this with your other work uh, on the significance of provincial capitals of the Vijayanagara Empire, such as Le Pakshi? Uh, you know, you've written about Le Pakshi. So, uh, you know, we talked about the headdress connection a bit, but uh, do you see other resonance? Well, I suppose, you know, it's the same geographical region. Right. You see, so there would be a cultural substrata, which is common. Yes. So that enables me to maybe better underst understand my what I was looking at at Vijayanagara. It happened many times that some, I remember, for instance, a case in which Dr. Anila Verghese and I were breaking our heads about a relief. And then suddenly I saw that scene in a Kalankari and I wrote to her, but you know, what we were looking at, it's this. And it turned out that it was uh, one of the Vira Shaiva saints that was illustrated. But I mean, it took 10 years till the penny dropped. Not, Not to speak, I mean, in one case, it took 25 years to drop, but it dropped eventually, yes. Um, you go around, you see, and then suddenly somebody, a casual, as a matter of fact, in the case of the one that it took 25 years to drop, it was a casual remark at the social event. <laughs> um, I mean, what can I tell you? <laughs> it's just a question of, you know, being alert, I suppose. Um, on the question of influence, uh, with chintz, we know that the tastes and patterns of the European market had a kind of determining influence. For instance, with the Palampore bed covers from the 18th century, which you find in stately homes in England. But are the Trempel hangings truly local with no influences from neighboring regions or from Southeast Asia? You spoke about Odisha. And uh, in fact, Sima Bhalla says that perhaps some of the headgear is, um, uh, you know, in the Balakanda Kalamkaris, Indonesian instead of Vijayanagara. Um, outside influences, do you, do you see them? And of course, Odisha is a neighboring region, so again, you could see that contiguity. Uh, yeah, and um, I am sure that if we had more cloths of that region, and I know that there is one at the Bhuvaneshwar State Museum, we could perhaps, if we would compare that one with works of Coastal Andhra, it would be very interesting to see the uh, common trends and the discrepancies. But I never saw that one at the Bhuvaneshwar Museum, so I can't say anything. Um, 
Well, um, I, since you come from Italy, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, of course, Italian art also illustrates stories. I'm thinking of the extraordinary fresco tradition, Giotto frescoes in uh, Padua, uh, Michelangelo Sistine Chapel, of course, the mosaics in St. Mark's in Venice, and uh, of course, tapestries, which were movable decoration for large architectural surfaces. So with Italy, uh, the list is endless. And uh, is there anything comparable to the Kalamkari tradition? Do you have some thoughts in a comparative frame? No, I not uh, off the cuff. I was thinking about it. And the only thing I, came, I could come up as we were speaking privately is the Mazzaro of Genova. And that is uh, inspired by the Palampos, not by the Kalankaris that we have seen today, but by the Palampos, which were exported via Genova to uh, Central Europe and then to England. No. But uh, clearly the storytelling of the murals and mosaics, uh, there is a similar sort of- Yes, of course, because the intent is the same. It's education of those who couldn't read. That's right, yeah, yeah. Mm. It's all this, if you have uh, like, um, you know, uh, cartoons, but without words. And the themes are the same because these are the life of the saints, the history of a particular church, some miracle which happened here or there. And then of course you have illustrations to episodes of the Bible and the gospels. Yes. So it's exactly the same repertoire, only of course in a different uh, cultural setting. And it was, as a matter of fact, the um, murals were called Biblia Pauperum, which means the books of the poor. poor. Ah, the books of the poor. I see. Yeah. Wonderful. Because the poor were supposed, or probably they were illiterate, and the priest explained the stories by showing them what was going on on the wall. Right. Um, uh, I think uh, we're coming near the end of our time. Um, I just wanted to add that Lata Reddy had said uh, on the question of women Kalamkari artists, uh, that uh, there are women working, creating works for the NGO Dwaraka in Sri Kalahasti. Um, yes, I've seen some. Yes. They were doing some drawings, uh, but as I told you, it was... Um, 98. So by now, probably there are many more, I think. Yes, there are. The last question from Amreshwar Galla. Um, and uh, he says that Machli Patnam Kalamkaris are producing more for commissions from London uh, and uh, right now. And as for the rest, uh, you've mentioned mostly saris and lungis, etc. Have you had a chance, he asks, to study Dutch Kalamkari collections, especially the no. right from Unfortunately Ep not. I was, uh, as a matter of fact, sadly, I have not been to the Netherlands for a couple of years. I was due to go to visit the Netherlands last November, but then of course, because of the pandemic, nothing happened, so. Um, I apologize to some of the, uh, many of the questions that we have not been able to address because of shortage of time, um, but uh, perhaps we can continue the conversation uh, via email if you forward your questions to, uh, uh, to the BIC. Yes, of course. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, your lecture, Professor Dallapicola, has been an enriching sequel to the talk we had on Kalam Kari last year and very valuable in broadening our understanding of this textile tradition, which like so many in our country really needs to be nurtured, badly hit as they've all been by the changes of modern life and now compounded with the pandemic. So thank you so much for speaking to us today from London. 
thanks also to our audience for tuning in. Please join us for our next program on the IC Streams. Thank you very much for having me and special thanks to Mr. Ragu who did a marvelous job with the slides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Anna.